welcome. I'm very proud to introduce today's presenter, H. Richard Milner IV. Before we get started, a few brief words about Rich. He's the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Education at Vanderbilt University in Nashville and recipient of multiple honors over the course of his career, including an AERA Fellowship, the National Association of Multicultural Education's Carl A. Grant Multicultural Research Award, and most recently, the John Dewey Award for Relating Research to Practice and the Innovations in Diversity, Teaching, and Teacher Education Award from Division K of AERA. Rich's research centers on policies and practices that support teacher success in urban schools. And Start Where You Are, But Don't Stay There, one of four books Rich has authored, has been recognized by the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education's 2012 Outstanding Book Award and the American Education Studies Association's Critic Choice Book Award. Today's presentation draws on Rich's most recent publication, these Kids Are Out of Control, Reimagining Classroom Management for Equity. Before I pass you over to Rich, I urge you to record his Twitter handle, which is featured here, and his email address. If you have any questions that we're unable to answer, don't he hesitate to reach out to him directly, and please do tweet. So Rich, I will now pass over the webinar to you. Thank you so much, Amara, for the opportunity to spend time with you uh, I am so excited to uh, spend time with you. Uh, thank you so much, Mara, for the opportunity to talk to educators across the country who are uh, committed to uh, educational equity. I mean, your being here uh, and participating in the webinar says a lot about your uh, commitment. I, from my view, I wish I could see your faces and interact uh, with you uh, personally because the energy was certainly, uh, I could certainly feel the energy. So I'm looking, really looking forward to uh, some of the questions later. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, thank Dan uh, uh, Alpert for his uh, commitment and also uh, believing in the book uh, project from the very beginning uh, and also to Jeff for uh, his assistance. So I want to uh, also, uh, just prior to uh, jumping right in here, I want to acknowledge my co-authors of, uh, of this book. Uh, they are uh, Heather Cunningham, uh, Professor C Heather Cunningham, uh, Professor Laura Gold uh, Kestenberg. And these uh, colleagues are, uh, you know, have spent uh, time in, each of, each of us has spent uh, time in classrooms. Uh, we come with multiple and varied perspectives, uh, really uh, with the, the main goal of thinking about how we might be able to advance uh, educational practices for equity. So I've always secretly wanted to be considered a scholar of language, literacy, and culture since I began my career in higher education. Uh, as a student, it was in my English language arts classes that I fell in love with learning. In middle and high school, I was introduced to Black writers of the U.S. and their transformative writing uh, from different genres, such as Phyllis Wheatley's A Farewell to America, the autobiography of Malcolm X, Benjamin Manneker's letter to Thomas Jefferson, uh, David Walker's appeal, the confessions of Nat Turner, Claude McKay's My Mother, Langston Hughes's I Too, Zora Neale Hurston's The Gilded, and Margaret Walker's For My People. It was in my literacy classes that I was able to make sense of a history of the U.S. in 18th century beginning. I remember reading uh, once and then reading over and over again, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's We Wear the Mask. Paul says, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mild with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise and counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh, Great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise, we wear the mask. Now at the time, I was not completely sure what Dunbar meant by the mask. But for me, as a 14 or 15 year old black male, the mask represented having to check important aspects of my identity space at the door to conform and assimilate 
to an educational system that didn't necessarily seem like it was designed for me. At that time, I was affectionately uh, immersed in what is known as hip hop culture. I was listening to uh, the Fat Boys and Dougie Fresh and KRS-One and Outkast and Run DMC and LL Cool J and NWA. And so I spent a lot of my time immersed in, uh, in what might be considered popular culture or hip hop culture. And I remember searching department store dumpsters and supermarket delivery piles for large cardboard boxes that my friends and I would disassemble and carry back to my friend, to my parents' house and disassemble them so that we could break dance on them. But in school, I had to check how I dressed, what I listened to, uh, all of my interests, all of my uh, 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 practices outside of school at the door when I walked in. And so the first uh, point I want to make here really is about reimagining how we think about the interests of students with whom we work. Similar to me, we might find that our students in our classroom feel strongly disconnected uh, with uh, practices inside of school uh, and, and the practices that they might engage outside of school. So point one really is we must and we should build on the interests of our students. The second reimagining that I hope we will think about is really how we think about the assets that all of our students bring into the classroom. Uh, and in order to do that, we sometimes, or people sometimes, or as educators, we might uh, categorize students, to, students who live below the poverty line as those who are incapable. But what we know from good science or from good research is that each student comes into our classrooms with uh, knowledge and expertise from which we should be building and learning. But I wanna give you a picture uh, of the poverty line just so you can get a sense of where uh, students, uh, some of our students might be. Uh, so for instance, uh, if a family of four earns $24,301, uh, that a family is considered above uh, the poverty line in 48 states. And so really uh, thinking about what the, uh, the, the, the poverty line or thinking about how the poverty line might uh, be, uh, uh, or how students living below the poverty line might uh, fair inside of schools, I think is really important. On the next slide, I show you the relationship between students' educational level and their, uh, their earnings or people's educational levels uh, and their earnings. And these data are actually uh, drawn from uh, the uh, US Census Bureau. So I'll be able to up the update these in 2020. But I just wanted you to get a sense of uh, the relationship between earnings and uh, educational level. And then the next slide shows over a career uh, span of work. And so uh, an important point, point that I want to make sure we think about in terms of a reimagining equity uh, for classroom management really is this idea that some of us uh, sort of operate from this notion of meritocracy. And meritocracy uh, would suggest that people are rewarded based mostly or solely on their ability, their performance, their hard work, uh, and their talents. And so mindset one, uh, some believe that all groups of people were born with the same opportunities. And if they just follow a formula, work hard, put forth effort and so forth, then they'll be successful. And people might point to exemplars, right? So we can think about, uh, you know, individuals who have been able to quote unquote, pull themselves up um, uh, by their boots uh, straps, such, such as, you know, athletes or, or uh, you know, we might uh, talk about or think about uh, Oprah Winfrey or, or, or Tyler Perry or others who, who've experienced. Uh, uh, when you think about even the students who are, uh, who live below the poverty line, we have to be aware of and be mindful that those students' experiences are going to be shaped by that, uh, that, re that financial or those resources related to what poverty might afford or not. Uh, mindset too, if people do not succeed, it is because they are not working hard enough, not because of, of factors that might be outside of their control. Again, this notion that people uh, succeed based on hard work and not considering other factors that might be uh, 
outside of students' control. You know, I read once that, you know, the meritocracy argument is like being born on third base and thinking you hit a triple, right? So this, you know, this reality is that, you know, if you were dealing with human beings and, you know, you've got to be mindful that students will show up uh, in, uh, in the schools and, and in classes having experienced all kinds of, of challenges. And we've got to, to be mindful that merit uh, is not the way that we should think about uh, uh, working towards uh, equity among our students. And so, you know, one teacher said, she said, you know, I get so pick up, sick of people making something out of nothing. My grandparents immigrated to this country with nothing and they made something of their lives because they worked hard, right? And, uh, but I'm mindful of what curriculum theorist Beverly Gordon shares. And what Beverly says is, and don't miss this, Beverly says it's difficult to critique the world and work to change it when the world works for you. I'll say it again. It's hard to critique the world and work to change it when the world works for you. So, so much about reimagining classroom management and reimagining how we think about uh, constructing or co-constructing an equitable environment is really thinking about how our own privileges, our own worldviews that are, allow us to even sit in these seats uh, and listen to and participate in this podcast. Another uh, student said, uh, with whom my teacher with whom I work said, you know, I'm going to be the kind of teacher who follows your advice and have high expectations. If a student is not turning in his homework on time, I'm not going to give any slack. It's going to be a zero in my grade book. I thought, is that what I said? And if that's what I said, I certainly did not mean that, right? So in other words, every student's situation, of course, is going to be different, and we've got to uh, keep that in mind. So factors far beyond merit give people and uh, allow people their positions uh, in society. And what we know from good sociological research is that family income is the strongest predictor of who goes to college. Not how smart people are, but how much money their families make. And so on the next slide, I actually show you uh, a proportion of students who are eligible for free uh, and or reduced uh, lunch. And so we know that we're talking about a pretty healthy uh, population of students when we talk about students who are living uh, below the poverty line. Now, I want to be clear here that the way we talk to and we talk about students living below the poverty line is important. Poverty is a result of a condition or results of conditions and situations. So I really encourage you to move away from language that would suggest that, uh, that, that there's a culture of poverty, right? There is no culture of poverty. Uh, and so when you think about cultural practices, you know, students might, or people in general might engage in particular practices, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's a part of their culture, right? So I might speak Spanish, but it doesn't mean uh, as, a, as a practice, but it doesn't mean I'm a part of the, the Latin culture. Uh, so I want to uh, move now to the third reimagining or the third imperative, which is really about this idea that we have to remember that our students are developing beings. You're grappling with, you're dealing with, you're working with, with students who are, uh, are developing. And so uh, when we think on a national level, and I'm going to now refer to these data as punishment referral data, and I'll talk more about that later. But if you look at these data, on the left-hand side, I share with you the proportion of students who are enrolled uh, in schools across the U.S. And these data are drawn from the Office of Civil Rights. So if you see on the left-hand side, it shows you the proportion of students enrolled in schools. On the right-hand side uh, on your screen, you will see the proportion of those students who experience inside of school suspension, right? So if you look, uh, we can use black students as our, our, our space of, of, of uh, analysis here. They represent about almost 16% of the general uh, student population, but they represent 31.8% of those, almost 32% of those who've experienced inside of school suspension, right? So if you look at the next slide, uh, black students represent about, again, about 16% of the general population. But don't miss this. They represent 40% of those students who experience 
outside of school suspension, right? And then there are those who would say, well, Rich, why are you focusing on black students, right? So let me be clear uh, here. I care about every student I work with and, and that uh, Latinx uh, slide there, every student. Uh, I care about white students. I care about our, our Asian students. I care about all students. And when we look at this data, we know something is going on and that we have got to figure out what's, what's happening in our classroom where we are perpetually putting our, our black students uh, out of the classroom. And you know, on a broader scale, black students represent, uh, black people represent about 12.1% of the general population uh, in the US, but they represent y'all 38.1% of those uh, in the prison population. So that tells you that there is a strong uh, school to prison pipeline, and, and I, I hate using that languaging, but the, the practices that we are, are, are uh, uh, advancing in schools often show up and they look very similar to what's happening uh, in the broader uh, society. And so if you look at the next slide, that the next slide actually shows you uh, expulsion rates, again, uh, which are rates that we, we know uh, have a huge impact on students' opportunities uh, to learn. And so what this means is that uh, we're grappling with disproportionality. I wish we, these, the slides previously, uh, we, we didn't have to grapple at all with students being pushed out of the classroom or pushed out of school. But we know proportionately that, uh, that about 16% of, of black students should be expelled if we were dealing with a proportional uh, representation here when in fact we're dealing with disproportionality. And so some big things I want you uh, to remember here, right? The first thing is that what we're, what, uh, when students are not in the classroom, they are not experiencing instruction, right? This is not rocket science. So we know when students are not in the classroom, the educational psychologists call this time on task. And so students are not experiencing. And then some of us wonder, walk around wondering, well, what is it about uh, what's happening with, in, with black students or what's happening with students who live below the poverty line or what's happening with students who have a, a learning exceptionality, right? What's happening with those students when we know that uh, there are correlations between instructional time and uh, students' uh, quote-unquote achievement on, on measures. And so I want to suggest that what we're doing is we're actually punishing not discipline students. And, you know, uh, researchers such as uh, Jeff Duncan Andrade and Pedro Nogueira, all the way back to Skinner, have talked, this is not a new idea. This knows, you know, Skinner talked about the importance of rewards over punishment. Yet in education, we tend to be doing the exact same thing. You know, so many of our students, and I've observed so many of our students who sit in these classrooms and they say, well, the teacher doesn't want me here anyway. So, so give me three days, you know, send me the ISS or suspend me. So it's not a discipline, right? In fact, what it is, it's a punishment practice. And so I want to suggest that we just need to call it what it is. Uh, drawing here from the research of Russ Skiba, uh, who's a researcher at Indiana University, he and his research team, and Russ, I want to qualify by saying is a white researcher who is doing work on disproportionality. And I want to offer that to uh, be clear. So Russ looked at thousands of disciplinary referrals uh, in their research team. And what they found was black and brown students were referred to the office for what's known as subjective infractions, right? Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you're too loud or you are too, or you're, dis you're disrespectful. White students were referred to the office for what's known as objective infractions. Right. And so when we think about this notion that race is sometimes seen as inconsequential to what we're doing, we know that something is going on when we um, would categorize or we, we would, would, would think about student behavior in a way that is, uh, is seen as, as subjectively problematic. Uh, we also know that infractions tend to occur or originate in the classroom, which means educators, those of y'all who are teaching in classes, right? Those of you who are teachers, teachers inside of classrooms, you play a huge role in students' opportunities to learn because most of the, the, the challenges we face related to classroom management show up on a classroom level. And, and, but get this, 
more times than not, the the uh, infractions are for uh, uh, for noncompliance vis-a-vis. Uh, in other words, what I mean is uh, you, you don't have your belt on, or uh, you know you're out of dress code, or uh, I ask you to put your phone away and you don't. Now, let me be clear here. I know those are important rules to be followed. Uh, one can argue against or for uh, you know, those, those rules. But what we also know is that most of the time, these infractions are not for uh, safety uh, uh, reasons, right? So, uh, and that means we have to really rethink and reimagine what we uh, send students out of the classroom for and create the kind of classroom ethos where it is co-constructed among everybody in the space. Listen, we're dealing with human beings, y'all. We're dealing with folks. And so when, when uh, Heather, uh, Lori, uh, Erica, and I wrote this book, when we decided uh, to title the book, these, these Kids Are Out of Control, it was very clear to us that we had heard uh, teachers, educators across the country, across the nation, uh, talk about students like that. Listen, bodies are not to be controlled by other people. It is not our responsibility to, to, to control the bodies, the minds of other people. You know, as educators, we have to create the kind, of, the kind of ethos, the kind of space where students will show up and uh, engage and, and, and want to participate uh, uh, in the learning opportunities available uh, in, the, in the classes. And so uh, in the next slide, I provide just some examples really building uh, from uh, the book these kids are out of control and, and others, uh, but really talking about the diff difference between discipline and punishment. So, you know, diff discipline is about uh, focusing on cognitively rich and rigorous curriculum practices. Punishment is about teaching to the test. You know, students are miserable. Uh, discipline is about modeling tenacity, persistence, and care. Punishment is about giving up on students, right? Uh, you know, some other examples, discipline is about investing in, in the individual to impact the community and not focusing on individual for the sake of individual success, but helping students understand that you live in communion with other people, uh, you know, and so forth. And so we really in this book try to tease out and help us move back to what it means to build discipline. So please don't leave this podcast, leave this webcast saying that Rich Milner said that we shouldn't focus on discipline, right? That is not what I'm suggesting. What I am suggesting is that we've got to, to strongly, we've got to seriously reconsider what it means to, to build discipline uh, in uh, our, our learning environments. Reimagining four is that we must understand and recognize the role, the salience, the importance, the centrality of race in the work we do. I, I conduct professional development across the, the, the country and what I, across the US, I should say, and what I found was uh, in one uh, situation, and this is, uh, this sometimes happens, you know, so I was given this outstanding professional development uh, session, if I might say so myself, right? Uh, and uh, the uh, one teacher said to me, uh, sort of stopped me mid-sentence and said, you know, our principal invited you here to talk to us about specific strategies to teach our poor children. I was devouring what you had to say. You were right on target until you got to this race stuff. Race has nothing to do with how I teach my kids living in poverty. What does it matter, really? And so for the remainder of the professional development session, despite my outstanding uh, pedagogical skills, the teacher decided to doodle, right? Because the, because the teacher did not want to recognize that race was central to understanding equity. Race was central to understanding what it meant to teach for justice, right? So, you know, uh, you know, I always say, like, imagine just because, and the, and the data points to this, this is not Rich Milner saying, I want to talk about race, right? This is the data are pointing precisely, right, to issues of race. You know, the data I just showed you that looked that, that talked about disproportionality, right, are raced, right? Even so, but, but, but we still, or we still, many of us have a very difficult time engaging race. And, you know, imagine an oncologist, a cancer doctor, right? Not focusing on an aspect of cancer because that, uh, 
uh, uh, oncologist felt uncomfortable, right? Can you imagine what, what that feel would be like, right? So in our field, uh, we sometimes avoid the very conversations that we, we need to have. Now, I want to be clear here that when I, when I talk about race, I'm not only talking about uh, skin color, right, or the physical or the phenotype. Right, I'm talking about the fact that that we know from good science, right, good research, that the race is socially constructed, that race is legally constructed, that race is historically constructed, uh, and so forth. And so, when you talk about race, you're talking about all of this. You're not only talking about skin color. If you if you mean race, then just say race. But if you if you mean I'm sorry, if you if you mean skin color, say skin color. But if you mean race, you're talking about all of these areas that play a role. And so one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is to think about uh, racism. I want you to think about how racism shows up and it manifests not only intentionally, most of the time in education, racism shows up unintentionally, right? So people are, uh, you know, educators, teachers, my best bet, I always say, uh, is on teachers. So teachers go in with great intentions. Teachers are working hard. Teachers are working overtime. Teachers are giving, you know, their all to support student learning and development, right? But if you're not critically examining your own privilege, you're not critically examining why you're making the curriculum moves you're making. If you're not critically examining your subjective interpretations of student behavior, it can make it very difficult for you to uh, enact an anti-racist or, or, or make it difficult for you to work towards equity in ways that we know are important. And one of the things that I would strongly encourage you to do uh, among your colleagues is, is, is start by engaging in this question. You know, this is, this is one of the questions that uh, I often engage with participants, with, with teachers in particular, and it really opens up the dialogue or related to why it is so challenging to us to engage the R word in the work we do, especially in mixed company. But let me be very clear here, right? The, the school districts, the schools, uh, uh, the classroom teachers, the, the school administrators, the school counselors, uh, the community members committed to this work, the ones that engage or who engage race are the ones that I see uh, the most progress made in terms of uh, ensuring a more equitable learning environment for students. And so uh, I just want to be clear here. I am saying, I sure am, that if you're doing education work, if you're teaching, you're doing race work. You can't do this work uh, and do it well. You can't do this work and do it in a way that really gets at um, equity uh, and gets at uh, a, a quote unquote, quote unquote, classroom management practices for liberation if you are not engaging race. This, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is really about, or people, I should say, is about education, is about race. And so we've got to make sure we're attending to. Uh, the, the, the R word. Uh, the next slide here uh, is actually drawn from the Urban Institute and I, I demonstrate here at the blue bar shows uh, the uh, demography among teachers uh, and then the yellow bar uh, demonstrates the, uh, the racial demography among uh, students. And if you were to add up or collate the student bars there, you'll, you'll find that overwhelmingly what we're going to see is that uh, schools will be populated by more students of color than white students, uh, and the projections are around 30, uh, you know, 45, 30, uh, sorry, 20, 35, 2050. We're going to see huge shifts in the race. And so, but why, you know, some people adopt this sort of colorblind orientation to their work. You know, they, you know, uh, many teachers say, you know, I just love all of my students. I don't think about race. Uh, I don't think about, uh, uh, racism uh, in, in my practices, right? So mindset one, if I acknowledge the racial or ethnic background of my students or myself, then I might be considered racist. Mindset two, if I admit that people experience and see the world differently, I may be seen uh, uh, as politically incorrect. I may offend others if I express my beliefs and reservations about race. 
Mine said three. I should treat all my students the same, right? Regardless of who they are uh, related to race and so forth. Now I want to now challenge and reach out to uh, building uh, administrators, superintendents and so forth, right? It is your responsibility to create the kind of environment where teachers as professionals, as people with expertise on the ground, feel comfortable to engage in the challenging conversations that can advance educational equity. So if, if the environment is not set up such that teachers believe they are safe or that teachers believe they can uh, uh, engage in, in, in conversations that could be uh, 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 put them in a vulnerable space, they will be less likely to do so. And so as administrators, you have to create the kind of environment such that, that teachers or that educators feel comfortable and, and are committed to this kind of, uh, of kind of practice. If we don't, the avoidance of race, right? The avoidance of thinking very seriously about uh, issues of, of racism and so forth. It makes it very difficult to, to recognize y'all. There's an overrepresentation of students of color in special education. There's an underrepresentation of students of color in gifted education. There is an overwhelming uh, number or percentage of black students, as I've shown you, referred to the office, and an overwhelming uh, number of black and brown students who uh, are subsequently expelled uh, and suspended. And so uh, one of the questions that I often get is really related to when do young people start to think seriously about race? And so I share a picture there of my my little ones there. Uh, I have uh, identical twin daughters. And uh, just to quick, uh, share a quick story, when they're about four years old, uh, you know, I, my uh, partner and I, my wife and I, we, we uh, rotate uh, putting them down uh, each night. And so, uh, not putting them down, that's the wrong word, but putting them to bed, right? We don't put them down. Uh, and, uh, and so um, one night, the, uh, you know, they do anything to stay awake. You know, daddy, I, I need water. We haven't had water all day, or will you read me another story, right? So, and, and I got to the end where I said, you know, that's it, we're going, to, we're going to sleep, no more, right? And so, uh, and as I got ready to turn the light off, the, uh, one of them said, Daddy, I have a secret. Up, oh, so I flicked the light right back on, right? I said, well, we don't keep secrets, baby. What, you know, what's going on? She said, we're black, right? So here I am doing work across the country with, um, with, districts and so forth. And I had never had an explicit conversation with my children about race, right? I had never had an explicit conversation with my children about race. And what I came to understand is that students or children are thinking about uh, race and they are trying to get their heads around what this race thing, mean, thing means, even though we as adults might be avoiding those explicit uh, conversations, right? What we know from good research is that, uh, you know, really drawing and building on the pivotal work of Mamie and Kenneth uh, Clark, you know, with the doll test, is that uh, there's a, a strong correlation or, or a strong link between students' uh, academic achievement, that is, you know, their test scores, their achievement on academic measures, and their sense of uh, racial socialization or their sense of racial uh, identity. In other words, what I'm saying is we do very little in schools to build students' uh, racial uh, identity when in fact that might be the very thing that we should be spending more time on. So the, the fifth uh, point here and final point that I want to make about our reimagining really has to do with the curriculum. And when I mention the curriculum here, I'm talking about uh, what students have the opportunity to learn, what students have the opportunity to learn. There's a curriculum that takes place uh, in the corridors of the school. You know, students experience a curriculum on the bus ride to the school. They experience a curriculum uh, as they observe what's happening uh, on the walls or not, right? So uh, the curriculum is salient and essential to thinking about classroom management. What we argue in these kids are out of control is that when, when good teaching is taking place, when curriculum aligns with the bodies, the minds, the spirits, the hearts of the students with whom you're working, uh, 
classroom, quote unquote, classroom management challenges take care of themselves, right? So uh, there are three forms of the curriculum that I want us to, to think about. The first form of the curriculum is what's known as the explicit curriculum. And the explicit curriculum is the curriculum that we know we teach, is the curriculum that's written down, it is the curriculum that's drawn from standards or our graded course of study. It might be for those of us in higher education. It might show up uh, through our, our syllabi. But the explicit curriculum is explicit. We know we're teaching it. Uh, a second form of the curriculum, according to Elliot Eisner, is what's known as the implicit curriculum. And the implicit curriculum is a curriculum that we teach. We, it's sometimes intentional. Other times it's not intentional, but it is certainly a curriculum opportunity that uh, students uh, experience. But it's not a curriculum opportunity or a curricular opportunity that's written down. So let me give you an example. When I taught high school English, I always asked students to pick paper up off the floor uh, before changing classes, right? You know, not a, a very innovative curricular move, but it, it's certainly a learning opportunity uh, for students that's implicit and not a part of the explicit curriculum. I was in a classroom uh, and the principal came over the uh, intercom and said, asked the teacher to send three strong boys to the office to carry some books back to uh, the teacher's classroom, right? So that's, there are so many implicit lessons embedded in that request, right? So that's a learning opportunity for students, a learning opportunity for all of us, right? So why can't why couldn't the teacher or the principal request just a student to, to pick the books up and carry them back? Or if they're going to dis be descriptive, why couldn't the teacher you know, or the principal request you know, three gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and so, so, and so forth, right? So this notion that we're teaching this curriculum often and we may not even be aware of it. And then the final form of the curriculum that I want to share here is the most fascinating form of the curriculum from my view, and that is the null curriculum. That is the N-U-L-L -L curriculum. In other words, we teach, students learn something based on what we don't expose them to. They learn something based on what we don't expose them to. So for instance, uh, I spent a lot of time in preschool classrooms trying to find the right environment, the right fit for my, uh, my twin daughters. So I was in a classroom one day and the, uh, a, a parent walked in wearing a red sweater and another student walked up and said, oh, your, your, your mom is wearing a, a red sweater. And the teacher said, that's right. And we talked about the color red yesterday and the red starts with the letter R. So I thought, wow, what a, you know, what a nice sort of reflective moment for a, a three or four year old, right? In the very same classroom uh, uh, on this particular day, a teacher walked in, a, a parent walked in, two parents walked in uh, and it was two mothers. And uh, the, um, another student walked up and said, oh, you have two mommies. I have a mommy and a daddy. I don't understand. And the, the teacher said, no, 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 no. Go back and play in your center, right? So that avoidance of the acknowledgement of the two mommies is a part of the null curriculum. In a very similar way, right? In a very similar way, when we avoid and we don't teach this. And when we avoid and we don't teach this. And when we avoid and we don't teach the killing of these or the murders of these black bodies, or we don't acknowledge and talk about the killing of these black bodies, or we don't acknowledge and we don't have conversations about these black bodies. We're sending a particular message about what and who is important in an environment. And let's go back for a moment. I told you earlier that there's a strong relationship between uh, students' sense of racial identity, right, and their achievement. And so when students have experienced or have observed the killing of these bodies, now I'm, I'm not an attorney, I wasn't there and so forth, I respect the police, you know, I want to make that clear, right? I want, but what we know is that these bodies were unarmed. So that sends a message to them about what and who is important. Let me tell you something. This is the curriculum that many of our students are having to grapple with. 
from a Frarian perspective, students are reading the word and, and the world. They're not just reading the word, right? And it's problematic that we know the names of Freddie Gray and Kristen Taylor and Gregory Gunn, Philando Castell, but we don't readily know, as Kimberly Crenshaw has made clear, the names of Melissa Williams and the names of Corinne James and, and so forth, right? And so when we think about who and what matters, this work is not only about those who might be read as males, it's also essential that we realize that black girls or those who might be read as, as women are grossly uh, left out of discourses that are so important in the grand scheme of how we think about what it means to work towards justice and liberation. Now, uh, I, I want to be clear here that I was uh, in, uh, I was doing a professional development uh, session in uh, Rockwood, Missouri, and I had flown into St. Louis. And uh, so as I was traveling to the professional development session uh, in my, my loaner car, my rental car, I was driving down the freeway and um, I saw blue lights. And so I pulled over and uh, when I pulled over, I uh, started looking for the registration. I couldn't find the registration in the car and the blue lights passed me by, right? So when I started back on the freeway, headed to my uh, professional development session, I, uh, I broke down and I started crying, right? And I couldn't quite get my head around why I was crying. But what I understood and what I understand now is that I was experiencing a form of vicarious trauma, right? And so when we talk about vicarious trauma, vicarious trauma is often used to talk about caregivers who are, uh, you know, working with students or people who have experienced traumatic experience. But I want to push that definition to suggest that some of our students in schools are experiencing tra vicarious tra trauma based on the killing of these bodies. And I think that's what was happening with me. I believe that's what was happening with me. I was reflecting on what it might mean if I couldn't find my registration, right? You know, my, my dad drove a forklift at General Motors for uh, 38 and a half years. And he doesn't talk on the phone a lot, but he called one day while I was teaching and he said, you know, Rich, he said, uh, you know, if you get pulled over by the police, you do exactly what you're told. You don't ask any questions. You don't, even if you think you're in the, in the, in the right and that you haven't done anything wrong. And he said to me, he said, Rich, you're going to bury me. I'm not going to bury you. And so if my father is having that kind of conversation with me and, you know, I am a 40 something year old person, right? Can you imagine the kinds of conversations students are having with their parents? But they walk into schools and we say, this is not part of the real curriculum. And so in this sense, our curriculum practices can be seen as a form of punishment because students are walking in having lived and experienced the real world. And when they come in schools, we say, okay, we're turning off all of your emotions. We're turning off all of your, you know, the psychological strain you're experiencing. And we're going to focus in on what really, really matters, right? And so what I want to do for the remainder of our time, we have about uh, five minutes uh, prior to uh, uh, questions and, and answers is to really talk uh, some about uh, tenets of, of restoration of, of restorative justice. And I want to uh, say that, this, that part of the work related to uh, restoration is, is about discourse, of course. It's about critical reflections and thinking very deeply, processing where you are and what has what potentially happened, and really voicing uh, and, and drawing on not only the cognitive dimensions of who we are, but also bring into the front stage, right, the affective components uh, of our work and life. And so there, there are some different uh, uh, themes here that I want you to remember. Now, research related to restoration or restorative justice practices are, are early, we're earlier in the, in the process. Uh, we know that uh, there are some criticisms related to uh, uh, restorative justice. So I want to be clear here that uh, there are aspects of this work that will likely be useful to your work. And there may be pieces 
that may in fact be uh, not as, as useful. Uh, so uh, for instance, if you were to uh, think here that, uh, that justice is, is important, right? So I wanna, wanna, wanna tie and talk about Maisha Wynn's uh, work here. She wrote a, a really powerful book called Justice on Both Sides. And what uh, Maisha stresses is that when we talk about restoration and we talk about restorative practices, what is essential that we keep in the conversation is justice. And justice, y'all, is about doing what is right. We know that uh, the relationship piece is essential, and we also know that restoration or the uh, central tenet of restorative justice really has to do with how we think about uh, healing and so forth. As educators, another point that has to be uh, considered is that we as educators have to model what forgiveness looks like. And so when I taught uh, high school English, I had a, a student who, uh, let's just be frank, gave me a hard time. I felt like uh, I could not reach the student. Uh, we did not necessarily uh, see eye to eye on a lot of matters. Um, and uh, again, I take full responsibility for my, my role uh, in the lack of uh, connections uh, that the, the student made uh, with me. Uh, and, but the student would engage in, you know, uh, conversations or do things that were uh, what I thought to be uh, uh, inconsistent with what a learning environment should be, right? So again, I'm, I'm, I'm revealing aspect of my teaching that I wasn't uh, uh, proud of, right? But what was important to remember is he, the student would come in the, the next day after, you know, having given me a difficult time the day, the, the day before and be like, what's up, Milner? How you doing, right? And I'll be like, no, oh, I can't believe you. You're coming in and want to shake my hand and you gave me such a hard time, right? Again, that was where I was in, in my development as a teacher, right? So you have to model forgiveness uh, in this space, right? When you're doing this work. And the, and the next piece that's essential is that you've got to remember that we sometimes get it wrong as educators, right? So when, when you talk about restoration, we talk about restorative justice, Restorative justice is not about, oh, I'm going to create these mechanisms and these systems so students can talk through and, and solve the challenges they face. No, 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 no. Restoration is also for you as the adult, right? And so you have to engage and you have to think very seriously about what role you play in uh, contributing to uh, practices that are inequitable uh, and the like. And then the, the next point here is, is essential. And that is that this work is really about students being at the center and students anchoring and deciding how uh, restorative justice practices might be, might show up. We talk uh, a lot about this idea of circling up um, and considering the, you know, the notions of, of uh, getting students to, to think about uh, what's, what's happened, what's going on. Uh, but I also want to be clear that restoration, these restorative justice practices are to, to, uh, to emerge and show up uh, in places not sent to a resource room, but they should show up in the classroom, right? They should show up in the hallway. There should be restoration circles if done appropriately, right, in the, in the lunchroom when things have happened. So, so, so you can circle up anytime, at any place in order to try to get things right that have actually gone wrong or to right wrongs, right? You know, I always say that, you know, the, the early childhood folks, especially the, the folks teaching preschool and first and second grade, they've really gotten it right. And so far as when they talk about the morning meeting, you know, I'm, I'm pushing for morning meetings through uh, higher education. You know, I'm, I'm pushing for this circle up time throughout the entire day. You know, when you think about what students are grappling with and what they uh, have experienced and, and, and so forth, uh, that is essential for any of us to have our heads around when you think about what might be happening. And so this affective languaging is important. And, these, and the, uh, the affective and the reflective questions and the reflective questions allow you to pose the kind of questions that allow students to think about what led up to. And I want to, if I could, I would bold and and italicized that piece during and after the conflict. What I've, I've found in observing restorative justice 
circles uh, and practices is that most of the questioning occurs based uh, questioning uh, is really geared towards the actual incident or the actual situation challenge or situation that uh, has occurred or emerged. But restoration is about thinking about what led up to the, the uh, occurrence. And that's why I applaud elementary school teachers who can really get their heads around what's happening with young people when they walk in the classroom, when they walk up in there. Because when students walk up in there and you see that there's something going, something on their face, right? You can read that something is happening with your babies. Then you need to, to be able to respond to that humanity on the spot rather than waiting until something has happened later. So this idea of restoration is not only in retaliation, but it is a, about building a collective ethos, a collective space that allows students to be and to, to, to share. Uh, ideally, these restoration, and when you think about restorative justice, it is when, when it's done on scale, at scale, you see much more powerful effects than just an individual teacher trying to uh, implement and advance this work. And so as we move into the questioning, I want to conclude by saying and really drawing from the outstanding work of, of Jack and Jacqueline Irvine and Gloria Lassen Billings and others, right? But I'm arguing here that what we really have is we, we don't have an achievement gap at all. What we really have is we have a restoration gap and we have a justice gap and we don't have an achievement gap, but what we really have is we have a healing gap and we have an equity gap and we don't have an achievement gap, but what we really have is a resource gap and we have a teaching gap and we have a school counseling gap and we have a discourse and talk gap and we don't have an achievement gap. But what we really have is we have an early childhood education gap and we have a family and schools connection gap and we have a wealth and uh, health and wellness gap and a liberation gap and we have a school and pop culture gap and we have a research gap and we have an opportunity gap, which is what I try and argue in. I know I can hear some folks out there saying amen. I try to argue that uh, in uh, these books. And so when the question is asked uh, related to who can teach for justice and who can teach for restoration, I wanna be clear that teachers from any racial, gender, sexual orientation, cultural or ethnic group can be successful with any group of students. But you gotta put the work in to do it. And so some students are going to succeed in spite of you and some students are gonna succeed because of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you today. Thanks, Rich. That was terrific. Um, you know, I ha we have time for a couple of questions, and if we can't get to all of them, I have a handful. I'll send you those questions, Rich, and we can get those answered and emailed out to people. So here's the first question. I'm curious how you might recommend integrating the null curriculum into the explicit curriculum. So one of the things that I think is really important is, is for us to think beyond what we've done in the past. So I, I want to be clear that the, you know, I, I don't want anyone to get in trouble. I realize you, we work within systems and structures, right, organizationally that sometimes would prevent our capacity to, uh, to, to teach aspects of the null that we might find to be uh, germane and, and, and essential. But, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue pressing for opportunities to listen to the realities of what's happening with our students. If our students are grappling with, you know, uh, issues of police violence against uh, black bodies, if our students are grappling with uh, issues of, of inequality or inequity, if our students are grappling with, uh, you know, a water crisis in Flint, Mich Michigan, whatever it happens to be, right, we, have, we need to meet students where they are. And if we know our subject matters well, we know our content well, we'll be able to make uh, explicit, not only in the implicit curriculum, we'll be able to make the null a part of the explicit curriculum because we understand the, the, uh, the wide range of what we're supposed to be teaching uh, anyway in a robust way. Terrific, thank you. I have another question for you. What type of discipline have you noticed in schools that have been 
more successful, you know, what type of discipline can people use compared to capital punishment? Uh, you know, what have you seen to be effective? Well, I would start by saying that every context is different. So I, I want to make clear that I'm not suggesting that anything that I might suggest here should be taken as, the panacea, as a panacea. But what I am saying is that at the root of building uh, disciplinary practices or building discipline among uh, people, right, is this notion of relationships. And so I would, I would say that the, the, the spaces that, find, that, that, that are, uh, cult, that, that cultivate the strongest discipline and disciplinary sort of ways of, of being are those environments where the teacher is and the students or the educators and the students care about each other, that they are you know, committed to uh, the success of each other, that, they, uh, that they, they share their successes, but they also share their struggles, where they uh, uh, you know, really get at the heart of, of relationships piece. So the relationship piece uh, is essential. The other part is uh, when students realize and they recognize you're not going to give up on them, they're much, much, much more uh, willing to uh, tend to be uh, to participate and to give you a shot or to give you, give us as educators uh, to give we uh, give those of us as educators uh, opportunities to uh, to teach them or to to work with them and to build a kind of learning environment. So, you know, I just want to be clear that. This work is about relationship building. This work is also about not giving up on students. This work is also about demonstrating and sharing aspects of our own life. Uh, you know, I found you know, in my own work that when, uh, you know, there are times when we uh, don't, you know, we, we, we as educators, we, we act as if we've had this thing figured out our entire life, right? You know, that we woke up one day and uh, the, the excellence just sort of, uh, emerged and when, when in reality, each of us has struggled, right? And each of us struggles with challenges and so forth. And so just being very frank and very, uh, uh, you know, clear with students that this is a process. Like we, we are all learning and growing in this space. Uh, and it gives students permission, if you will, to take risks that they may not take otherwise. And it's in that sharing of our own challenges, right? Uh, you know, even reflecting back on when we may have struggled with our own, you know, in a course or whatever it, it happens to be. Those are the kinds of opportunities that I think really build um, um, you know, the kind of environment that would uh, allow us to not have the challenges that we might have otherwise. Thank you very much, Rich. Um, I, uh, that brings us to the end of the questions. I think now is a good time to turn it back over to Maura. Thank you very much, Rich, for an absolutely powerful presentation. I speak on behalf of Corwin and all of the attendees. Uh, Rich, if you can please um, advance to the next slide. As I, I just wanted to let you all know, there's one more ahead of us, that much of this presentation is based upon Corwin's recently published, These Kids Are Out of Control. And a special thanks for having attended. We will be sending out a, uh, an email early next week giving you the opportunity to save 20%. We'll also include in that email a PD certificate, copies of the PowerPoint, and copies of the presentation, which you're free to share. If for some reason that uh, this doesn't come through, feel free to reach out to me directly at Mora, M-A-U-R-A, dot Sullivan, at Corwin.com. And thanks again, Rich. By far the most powerful presentation I've ever participated in, and I've presented I participated in a bunch of them. Thank you.